welcome back to another episode of Triple D. So, my camera lady has taken up a second job as well, so she is not here with us again. Well, tell, but, tell them what our camera crew is doing. So, the camera crew is milking goats right now as we speak, actually. So, uh, she took up a small part-time gig just for a few days, helping out some of our neighbors. Got so, she's milking goats right now, so we uh, will continue onwards. But, Steve, today we're finishing up Chapter 5. And before I do that, I'd like to plug one of the books. It's from Reformed Academic a Press, a short commercial break as well. So this is uh, by William Beveridge. It's revised and edited by Ligon Duncan, uh, well known to most of our viewers, especially in Reformed and Presbyterian and even Baptist circles. So this is a short history of the Westminster Assembly. A uh, great little book. It's going to discuss all the... Pro uh, the planning and preparation that went into the Westminster Assembly. It's got a beautiful cover on it with Westminster Abbey as well, uh, discussing the history. So if you're more interested in what was going on during the time period of the Westminster Confession, of its pinning of uh, the Puritan era and such as well, this was written by a Scottish Presbyterian minister, uh, William Beveridge, in the late 1800s. But a great little historical treatise, though, so I'd highly recommend you find that. Uh, I'll probably include a link in the video uh, when I send it out to everybody, if you'd like to pursue that. But Steve, let's jump into our text today then. So we are in Westminster chapter 5, section 7, and we'll be ending Westminster chapter 5, and then we'll go on to a new area as well of the confession. So let's read our text then. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner it taketh care of his church and disposeth all things to the good thereof. So, Steve, let's jump into this today okay. then. So, as the providence of God doth in general. So, discuss what that means. What does a general providence look like? General providence, I think, would be as it relates to the entire world. Believer, unbeliever, God sovereignly controlling what's in your life, my life, whether I'm believer or unbeliever. Governments, nations, would be my thought on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, you would distinguish then between a general providence as we see given to the nations versus how he deals with the church. Absolutely, because that's what it is in the Bible. So that's, the, that's what we we'll see in the text. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, Steve, does, if that's the case, then does God actually deal kindly with those who are unbelievers for a time at least? Oh, absolutely, because in many ways, if you look at the unbelievers around you, a, a Christian may say, I have terrible health. My health is terrible. That non-believer's health is great. Mm -hmm. Or the non-believer's making more money than I am. He's, his, he may have a better marriage than a Christian does. So that's that's the kindness of God, the providence of God in, in that area with non-believers. Absolutely. I once said to a friend of mine that you breathe God's air, mm -hmm. you yeah. live in God's world, you eat God's food, So and yet with the same mouth that you take in God's food, you curse him with your own mouth. So okay. it's uh, it's really biting the hand that feeds you. And that's pure Van Til. Absolutely. Which is scripture, but if, absolutely. if you want to get, dig into detail about that teaching, study Van Til. Absolutely. On that one, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, but he deals differently with the church. So how does he deal differently with the church? Well, the church is God's chosen people. So God loves everyone, but he doesn't love everyone the same, as we talked about last week. The church is God's chosen. So everything that takes place in the church is for the good of the people in the church. It's, for, it's all for God's glory. But when you're a Christian, whatever happens in your, play, in your life is for your good, spiritually. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a special kind of providence special that he providence. gives That's to right. the church yeah. rather than just a general providence. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve, are those things in antithesis, is, are they pitted against one another? Is... Is there anything wrong, for instance, with general providence, or is there anything that's better about special providence? What are the differences that you would delineate there? Well, there's nothing wrong with it, because that would imply that there might be something wrong with God or the way he's running the world, which we know is not true. So whatever the Lord does is good, and that is his plan. That just as you, you may deal one way with your family, your wife, and you would deal another way with your neighbor, but you care for both, but it's in a different way. So no, there's nothing wrong with either one. And there, there is not, I don't think there's a, a great, there's not a battle between the two. It's just God working with both in a particular way. Absolutely. And I've said before, this is how God, how unbelievers can know things or how uh, 
certain people can come up with great vaccines, and they may be an atheist, right. for instance. Uh, but God but has then allowed. we benefit from that vaccine. We benefit from leaders. that vaccine, yeah. absolutely. And that's just God's common grace, God's mm. common providence, His general providence that He has lavished upon the nations. He's still providential in all things to everyone, even to the sparrow of the, the field right. for that, or the lilies of the field and the sparrow of the air. God still feeds them. Yeah. That's a general kind of providence. It's not a special providence that he's dealt with you and I right. or the members of the church or so. He has saved us. We have a special kind of providence that's totally different from that of just common providence. Well, you talked about the sparrow, which mm -hmm. brings up another point. God created all these different animals. Mm -hmm. And if you study, especially in the Old Testament, God has a tremendous care and love for animals. Absolutely. So our camera crew today is taking care yes, of an animal. Absolutely. And we as Christians should care for animals. Absolutely. If we love, right. not only love people, but love God's creation. Dogs, cats, goats, whatever it may absolutely. be. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, God takes care of his creation. Uh, he providentially nourishes it. He doesn't uh, starve it of rain. Uh, not everywhere, at least. And he has a plan for everything. God's hand is still active as it was during creation. He's not creating new things, of course, but his hand of providence is still very much active in the world, uh, in all things. So, Steve, let's continue on then. So, dispose of all things to the good thereof. So, we're going to jump into a proof text. It's a famous proof text here in just a minute. So, do bad things happen to good people? Well, I think the first question, or the answer is, what do we? Do? how do we define bad things? Hmm. Absolutely. What we think is bad things, maybe I lose my job, I get cancer, have a heart attack, I have a loved one that dies. It's not a bad thing if you're a believer. Absolutely. It's part of a fallen world, but God's grace has overcome that and will give us the ability to overcome that. So I don't think bad things happen to good people. And also, secondly, we need to say we need to find the word good for good people. Spiritually speaking, none of us are good. We've Absolutely. all gone astray and left on our own. We're going to want to sin, but because of the Christ saving us and the Holy Spirit working inside of us and being a part of us, uh, we then be, be move from being someone that doesn't want to do good things to wanting to, to do good things Absolutely. for the Lord, but maybe failing along the way. Absolutely. 100% in agreement with that. The scriptures are very clear that we are totally depraved. Mm -hmm. We have no good within us, inherently at least. All that we do is wicked. Uh, and I don't think, though, that a lot of the Christian community would, would agree with that doctrine. No. No, the, the broader evangelical church of today, if you go and look at just any regular church or you watch somebody on television or on the radio, normally they'll say, well, mankind is generally good. Right. But that's totally wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that man is depraved. He can't help himself. Uh, and if he chooses, if he has a free will to choose, yeah. he's going to choose to sin every time. Yeah, the, well, the Bibles are where we'll hear things like the devil against me, God's for me. <laughs> I'm going to break the tie there kind of thing, but that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches at all, absolutely. So, Steve, with that, let's jump into our proof text for the day. Right. So, I am going to begin with Amos chapter 9, okay. verses 8 through 9. And in here, the scriptures read, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I am commanding... And I will shake the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. So we see here God's providential care of both wicked men, the sinful kingdom, and that of his holy nation of Israel, of the Old Testament church. But uh, it also doesn't spare them from being sifted. They're going to be judged. Uh, if you read on in the Old Testament, you'll see very clearly that ten tribes are gone. Uh, God totally removes them and mixes them in with other nations. Uh, they're not his, his people any longer. Uh, you see that in Hosea as well, where God prophesies against them through the ministry of Hosea. Uh, but in the end, he does destroy it, but he doesn't totally destroy his people. Now, he will purge us. There, the church goes through some hard times. If you read through Christian history, you'll see that all the time. The church gets purged, it grows at times, then it goes back, and then it grows more, and then it goes back, and there's persecutions that come, but... Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he still cares for his church, even in times like this where it seems that the world is against us. The world is against yes. us. The world but God is against is not. us. God is not, though. Yeah. But if God be for us, then who would be, be, be against us? Yeah. Absolutely. So, Steve, with that one, could you turn to our next sure. one? So, 1 Timothy 4.10 is where we're sure. looking at here. Yeah. For it is for the, this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God 
who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Mm, absolutely. So, Steve, what is what is that exactly saying there when it says that he is the Savior of all men, but especially of believers? Well, I think the Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to be lost, uh, or wants all to be saved. Now, we'll never completely understand that. Absolutely. But there is, there is clearly in the Bible, elect and non-elect. That's clear. So that we understand. And, but God is the Savior of all men in that they're living, they're working, they're, they have a family, they have a, maybe a good life while they're here, Absolutely. but they're not born again, they're not, and they're not saved if they're the elect. So, they're, I mean, that is difficult that Absolutely. we struggle with that, but it clearly is what the Bible says. Absolutely. R.C. Sproul once said that God doesn't get his willies from damning people. It's not like he enjoys sending people to hell. It's, that's, that's totally antithetical to God. Does he receive glory? Yes, of course. God receives glory from anything happens but uh it's not like he enjoys doing that but he gives the person what they want yeah. and what they want is to sin they don't want god and we'll see more of that when we move into the next absolutely chapter. when we move into the next chapter so spoiler alert right yes. there too <laughs> read ahead <it>. absolutely so <laughs> our next proof text then is romans eight twenty eight, a oh. famous verse here dealing with the, god's providential care specifically of the church and his special providence and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So God has that supernatural, providential care for His church. Whenever something wrong happens, whenever you lose your house or your car breaks down, there's a plan at work there. You might not know what it is. Uh, Steve and I have both been through hard times in that. We can both honestly say that we've come out of those things as more dependent on Christ as better sanctified men and women as well throughout the ages. But there are good things that happen. We know that the trial is not fun at the time, of course, but God is working actively through that. It's through His providential care, and He keeps us through those things. And the goal is sanctification, Christ-likeness. So God continues to work together all things, not anything, not small, just small things, not just big things, but all things work together for our good. We've talked about the story of Joseph before, how he was thrown into the pit, and it seemed really bleak there. But he says in the end of it, you meant it for evil to his brothers, but God meant it for good. So with that, Steve, let's turn to our last proof text. So Isaiah 43, verses 3 through 5, as well as chapter as verse 14. So Steve forgot his large print Bible today as well. <laughs> we'll so we're, we, we have to reveal <laughs> that little, little tidbit to our listeners and such. So Isaiah 43, Steve. Okay, here we go. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given you Egypt as a ransom, Cush and Seba in your place, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. Now jumping to verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans into the ship in which they rejoice. Mm. So once again, God's care for those even who persecute his church. God cares for, he cared for the Roman Empire when uh, Nero lit us up for barbecues. But at the same time, God's patience is limited and at some point they get the wrath of God for their for their sin. Absolutely. Might so, not be in our lifetime. We might not see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's plenty of times where we look at the television or look at other things and say, that man got away with murder. Yeah. Uh, that old, that old uh, saying. And that's true. That does happen. But God doesn't forget. Yeah. And God keeps a list of those things as well. So, Steve, with that, I think we can end for the day then. So, if you would love, if you would uh, end us with Psalm 46 as well. So sure. we always end with a psalm here at Triple D. So meditate upon these words of the scripture in, as you tune in with us next week. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whom streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. Mm, absolutely so. And we rest in that. We rest in God, our refuge, our rock, and our strength always. So no matter where the turbulent tides of life may take you, dear listener, 
always remember that God is a solid rock who does not move nor change with the seasons. So with that, we'll invite you to our next Triple D next week. Uh, We'll begin with Chapter 6 of Westminster Confession of the Fall of Man, of sin, and of the punishment thereof. So as we continue to systematically work through the Westminster Confession of Faith. So we would love for you to tune in with us next week, and we pray God's most richest blessings upon you. We thank you for being with us today.